welcome today. Uh, we are starting a brand new series called Boomerang, Boomerang. And the whole topic we're going to be discussing over the next few weeks is what comes around goes around. I'll never forget when my mother came home, she had a boomerang. She gave me a boomerang. It was a little different than the typical Aussie boomerang. It actually had four different sides on it. And I'm one of those guys, I don't know about you, I'm, I'm one of those people that I'm going to do something until I, I mean, like it works. I mean, I'm going to keep doing it, keep doing it. Somebody gave me a unicycle. I tried that unicycle for like three weeks until I could ride that bad boy. I fell down. And so I had this boomerang, and I, would, I threw it. It took me two weeks to get the exact proper trajectory, the right flip of the wrist, in order for that to go out and to come back. And, and what I want to do today and, and over the next few weeks is I want to talk, we're going to talk about a lot of different things, specifically uh, around finances. We're going to talk about relationships because whatever you sow, you're going to reap. And we want everybody to get that principle. Now, here's what we're also during, do, doing during this time is we are ramping up for the first weekend in December where we're going to make as a church a commitment towards kingdom builders. Um, if you don't know what Kingdom Builders is, Kingdom Builders is a person, not a program. And it's our way of building the vision that God has given us. So I want to be sharing about vision of the church, where we're going. Um, I want to thank you so much for your patience uh, with, with all the stuff that's been going on in the building. Hopefully you think it's still exciting that all the construction that we're, we're having. And, and uh, we're going to have some tours available for you to go through and see uh, the, the children's area that's going to be open in just a couple weeks. It's very exciting to see. Um, I, know, I know sometimes it's a little challenging when things are going on, but it's, it's fun to watch. And it's also fun to participate. And we want everybody to participate in this. Every person to participate. And the best way that you can do that is with your finances. And we're going to encourage you in that. And so today I want to talk about uh, sometimes when it comes to what, coming, what comes around goes around. Is, and specifically about finances, sometimes we just need a little attitude adjustment. Right? Has your wife ever told you you needed attitude adjustment? Come on, guys. I mean, my wife tells me weekly that I need an attitude adjustment. Uh, usually happens about Wednesday, and uh, she says, if you don't get it straight, then, you know, hey, listen, I'm going to slap you upside the head. And she does that every now and then. Um, I want to tell a story. There was, there was a young lady who uh, got to the airport very early one time on her way across the country. And she had a few hours before her plane was about to leave, and she just by, by some miracle, she made it through TSA in and, and record time. And, and uh, she, she decided to go and get a book and some, some snacks because she had to wait. Airport was very busy. She walks into the bookstore. She grabs this book. It's one of the top-selling novels. She's so excited about reading it. And she grabs a bag of cookies and goes and finds a seat in the airport near her gate. Well, the place is so busy that this guy plops down right beside her as she's engrossed in this book. I mean, the, this book is amazing. And as they're sitting side by side... All of a sudden, to her amazement, he reaches over and grabs a cookie out of the bag. And she's like, what the, what is going on? And she's just, she doesn't want to break, you know, like looking at the book. And she's thinking, what in the world is this guy doing? Um, I can't believe he has the audacity to eat my cookies. And, and so she reaches over into the bag. And every time she reaches in, he reaches in. She reaches in, he reaches in, and she's thinking, what in the world is this guy doing? How, how can he do this? And, it, and then it gets to that awkward moment where there's one cookie in the bag, and she's thinking, no, he's not. No, he's not going to eat the last cookie. So he happens to reach in, grabs the cookie, breaks it in half, and with a huge smile on his face says, here. She grabs it out of her, his, his hand slams the book, throws her stuff in her bag, and walks to the gate as they're calling her plane. She's just amazed. I can't believe what's going on. She gets on the plane. She sits down. She's like, she's trying to wash this from her memory banks, you know, and so she reaches into her bag to grab the book when all of a sudden she grabs her bag of cookies. And she realizes that he wasn't eating her cookies, but she was eating his cookies. See, when it comes to money, when it comes to finances, sometimes we just need a little attitude adjustment. 
We just need to be adjusted. We all have attitudes toward money. All of us have a different way that we think about money. Uh, my, my wife and I, we've been married for 23 years, all in a row. Come on, somebody. <laughs> Got to clarify that these days. I always have to, have to clarify it. All in a row. And we grew up very differently in regards to finances. She grew up very wealthy. She was on the other side of the tracks. Uh, she had everything. There wasn't much that she needed when it came to money, when it came to things. However, on, I grew up on the other side of the tracks. We were so poor, we couldn't have even afford the OR. We would just po. Um, I, we, my, it was just my mom and I, she worked a, a lot of jobs in order to take care of us, and it was very difficult. We were so poor, you know, um, we were so poor that you, I didn't even know that there were things that we needed. You know what I'm talking about? Uh, some of y'all grew up like that. You, you, when, you, when you find out, you're like, oh my gosh, they have those? <laughs> you were blown away. Well, we all have, I grew up with an attitude or a position that I thought about money. And then when we got married, and you put, you know, somebody that has grew up Having everything and somebody that grew up didn't have everything, you put those two together and it took us a little while to get into a rhythm. In order for us to do that, we had to really find God's attitude towards money. Now here's what the Bible says in Proverbs chapter 14 verse 12. It says, there is a way that seems right to a man. I want you to hear that. There is a way that seems right to a man. All of us have a way that we think is right to us. But, but that way typically is way, the way the world or our experience or, or the way we grew up or, or how we've kind of done things in our life, but its end is the way of death. Now, when it comes to the Bible, uh, there are over 500 verses in Scripture that talk about faith, over 500. There's over 500 verses in the Bible that talk about love, but check this out. There's over 2,000 verses that talk about money. Now, it's interesting to think about, why wouldn't Jesus have spent more time talking about worship, or, or prayer, or love, or faith, or heaven, or hell? Well, because Jesus knew that God's greatest competition for our heart was not fame, it wasn't popularity, it wasn't success, it wasn't a, a, a sport or a hobby. The greatest competition for our heart is money. That's why the Bible says, as Pastor Michael quoted today, Matthew chapter 6, verse 21, and I want to read it out of a different paraphrase. This is the message paraphrase. Listen to what it says. It's obvious, isn't it? This is Matthew 6, 21. The place where your treasure is, listen, is the place you will most want to be. Where your treasure is, your heart will be also. Where your treasure is. Isn't, isn't it interesting that wherever our treasure is, that's where we're going to want to be and end up being, whether we want to be there or not. We're going to follow our finances. So I want to talk about three attitudes, okay? Three different attitudes that maybe we need some adjustment. Now, how do you know if you need adjustment in this area? Let me tell you, when I talk about the attitude, it makes you a little upset. Kind of squirm a little bit in your seat. You know, maybe hide your wallet. Hide your No, wait, God, don't. I'm, you know, I already gave once today. Okay? So I want to talk about three different attitudes, and I have made up words to go along with them because I just love making up words. And all these words should be on Wikipedia. All right? Here's the first one if you want to write this down. A generous attitude or a generositude. Isn't that a great word? That's a great word. It should be a word. I'm telling you right now. A generosity, a generous attitude. What is a generous attitude? Well, in the Bible, it pits a generous attitude with a stingy attitude. There's a big difference between being stingy and being generous. Proverbs 11, verse 24. I'm going to give you some Bible. The, word, the world of the generous gets larger and larger. Let me read it another way. The influence of the generous grows bigger and bigger. However, the world of the stingy gets smaller and smaller. Another way to say it is the influence of the stingy gets smaller and smaller. Now, when you think about the attitude of generosity or a generosity, this is the, the attitude that God has. This is the characteristic of God, a characteristic of God. And we know that because in Psalms chapter 51, um, David is basically writing a psalm around repentance. 
And in the middle of the psalm, he makes this statement in verse 12. And he says, God, will you uphold me by your generous spirit? Your generous spirit. Paul said it this way in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 6. He says, remember, okay, so he's saying, remember this. A stingy planter gets a stingy crop. A lavish planter or a generous planter gets a lavish crop or a generous crop. I want each, this is Paul talking to the church in Corinth. He's talking to a local church. I want each of you to take plenty of time to think it over and make up your mind what you will give, how you will be generous. Why? That you will protect yourself against sob stories and arm twisting. God loves it when the giver delights in his giving. God can pour on the blessings in astonishing ways so that you're ready for anything. I want you to hear this. When you, be, when you adopt a generous attitude, God prepares you for anything and everything. Anything and everything. More than just ready to do what needs to be done. In other words, a generous attitude makes your world bigger. You start to see things differently. Now, I've met quite a few stingy people in my life. I'm sure you have too. And I want to give you some characteristics of stingy people. First of all, being stingy is different being, from being frugal. And we may talk about this in a, in a couple weeks about using money wisely. Being frugal just simply means that you, are, you have an intelligent and wisdom approach to your resources. Being frugal. Did I say that? Being frugal. Being frugal. Different than stingy. You know how I know that? Because uh, stingy people are typically sad people. They just, have, they just carry a low countenance. They kind of mope around. I'm serious. I mean, it's, it's, it's amazing to me how, how people who have a lot of resources and, and they have the ability to do things, they're so sad. And they're so, they're, their countenance is so low. Why is that? Because stingy people are scared people. They operate in a spirit of fear. What are they afraid of? They're afraid that there's not enough. They're, they, they're afraid. People, are, people who are stingy are afraid. That's why they hold what they have, because they're afraid there's not enough. i got to keep what i got, just in case, you know, if you take some of mine, then there's not going to be enough. What that is, basically, is that stingy people operate in a poverty spirit, a poverty mindset. What is a poverty mindset? You may have heard that before in church, a poverty mindset. This is something that I had to break in my life, because I, I didn't, I, I kind of lived in this little bubble of po, ponus, and I had, to understand, I had to learn to understand that there was way more than what I had and that God had way more than enough. It was amazing to me when I discovered that one of God's names was more than enough. <laughs> I got this picture one time of waves. I remember, I remember sitting at the beach, and, and this was when I was getting this revelation early in the 90s when I first became a Christian. And I was starting to learn how to give and, and tithe and do all these things. And the Lord showed me, look, look at that wave coming in. I was sitting on the beach and I'm watching these waves coming in. He goes, you see the next one? He goes, there's another one coming. And guess what? They're not going to stop coming. And, and Troy, if you will get in line with my attitude and money, then the blessings of God will never stop coming. Just like waves. That's what more than enough means. It's like waves continuing to crash. You ever sat on the beach? No matter how small or how big, they just keep coming. They just keep coming. But it doesn't happen for stingy people. See, a poverty mentality operates from a position of lack. And so when, when we don't have, when we feel like that this is all there is, then we will protect what we have wow. instead of realizing that there's so much more. It's like, it's like these two farmers that were having this conversation about being kingdom builders, Bill and John. And Bill turns to John one day, and uh, they're sitting out at the farm, you know, and, and they had heard a good message at Freedom House about kingdom builders. And, and Bill says to John, hey, John, if you had a $1,000, would you give it to kingdom builders? And John's like, of course I would. I love building God's kingdom. I love it. So Bill turns to, to John again. He goes, well, what if you had, had $10,000? Would you give it to kingdom builders? He goes, of course I would. And then he turns, Bill turns one more time to John. And he goes, well, if you had a pig and a goat, would you give it to kingdom builders? And John goes, now, wait a second, Bill. I have a pig and a goat. <laughs> that, that'll sink in in a little bit. 
That'll sink in a little bit. So let's talk about what generous people look like. Generous people have a whole different spirit, a whole different attitude. They have the spirit of God. See, the word generous means to be willing. It means to be ready. It means to be inclined to. In other words, somebody that's generous has a a generosity. The word attitude, the first time it was used was in the early 1700s, and it means a statue position, the position of a statue. So when they would create art, the position of the statue was called its attitude. See, when when, when someone is generous, they are leaning in to God. They are ready or willing or inclined to the need. They see the need, and as a result of that need, they lean into that need. They're waiting. Okay, God, what's next? Well, what, what, what are you saying to me now? Where do you want me to go with this now? That's what generosity is. Gener- generous people are about God because they carry the nature of God. They are about God because they carry the nature of God. Generous people are about others. They understand the power of God putting someone else's need in front of them so God can meet their need in the process. It's a huge, it's a huge mind shift. Come on, look at your neighbor and say, generosity. Generous, generous people typically carry the gift of giving. Now, what does that mean? Maybe you've never heard that statement before, the gift of giving. Well, in the Bible, the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit all gave gifts to the church. The Holy Spirit gave nine gifts of the Spirit, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And then, and then Jesus, in Ephesians chapter 4, gave five gifts to the church, the five-fold ministry, pastor, teacher, apostle, prophet, evangelist. Did you know God gave gifts to each person? The Father, in Romans 12, gave seven gifts. This is the cool thing. He gave gifts like prophecy, leadership, encouragement, exhortation, teaching, ministry, but also one of the gifts was giving. Now, I don't know about you. Have you ever been in a life group or maybe a meeting and somebody just prays like you start coveting their prayers? You know, like they pray really good. Like, they, they know exactly where to place the thee and the thou to make it sound really good. Like, and you're at the fin- and it's like, when they pray, it's just like God shows up. It's like, boom! And you're like, man, how come when I pray, that doesn't happen? It's like they have a red phone to God, you know? They have the bat signal, the God signal. They, as soon as they start praying, it's just like, boom, it just opens up. You know what I'm talking about? Come on, anybody with me today? All right, I've been there, you know, I'm just being honest. You know, you got to be honest in church. Because if you're not honest, if you lie in church, God will kill you. Okay, so just make sure you don't lie in church. Just as spiritual as prophecy and teaching and encouragement is the gift of giving. Listen, don't deny yourself the ability to walk in a spiritual gift because you're a generous person. Don't ever deny yourself. You have the gift of giving. If you're generous, typically you have the gift of giving. And here's what God says he'll do for you in 2 Corinthians 9, verse 11. He says, you will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. A generosity. Let your neighbor say generosity. Here's the second attitude. is an attitude of sacrifice or a sacritude. Come on, that's a good word. Come on, Don. That's a great word. That should be in Wikipedia. What does it mean to sacrifice? Sacrifice means the giving up or the loss of something for a bigger and better cause. Another way to say it would be that I'm, when I sacrifice, I am forfeiting my current benefit for a future bigger thing. A sacritude. Let me ask you a question. And um, just think about this. What would, be, it, it, what would be the greatest sacrifice you could ever give? What would be? Just answer that for yourself. What would that be? Now, the first thing I, 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 would, I would say is the giving of my life. Would you agree? It's a pretty big sacrifice. Let me, let me just throw one that might be even bigger than that. And if you have children, then this may make more sense to you. Not the giving of your own life but having to make the choice 
to give the life of someone you love. That would be really hard. I don't know if you, if you have kids and your kids have ever been sick, you feel so helpless in regards to their sickness. I've been in, I sit in their room, you're like, oh my gosh, I wish, I wish I was in their place. Anybody ever think like that? You're, you're like, you just feel so helpless because they're dealing with something. They're coughing, they have a fever or whatever they're dealing with. Well, imagine that you had to make the decision to sacrifice your child. Well, one gentleman in the Bible had to make that decision. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 17. I'm going somewhere with this. Everybody say a sacritude. It was by faith, Hebrews eleven seventeen. 17. It was by faith that Abraham offered Isaac as a sacrifice when God was testing him. Abraham, who had received God's promise. Now, you, you may or may not know the story. Abraham was given the promise that he would be the father of the nations. He would inherit the nations. That God would give him this land and he would, he would create a people. Matter of fact, God even changed his name to mean father of many nations. There was a problem, though. Abraham did not have a kid. So he ends up having a child at 100 years old. Him and, him and Sarah, they have a, a child at their very oldest age, and his name is Isaac. And so after they have the child, God comes to Abraham and says, Hey, listen, I want to test you to see if you really have faith in me. Kill your kid. What? Put yourself in Isaac's place. I, I do that very often. I'll put myself. You know, it's easy to, it's, sometimes it's easy to think about it from Abraham. But what if you're Isaac and your dad goes, hey, you go to your dad and you go, hey, dad, what are we doing today? Going up on a mountain, I'm going to kill you, boy. <laughs> I'm punching my dad in the face. I don't know about you. And running as fast as I can, right? Like I'm leaving that building. But Isaac doesn't do that. Why? Because he understood the principle of God. Abraham understood the principles of God. Listen to this very closely. You are either being tested or you are being trusted. You are either being tested or you are being trusted. You are either in a state of being going through a test or you are in a state of being trusted because you just passed the test. Why am I in this job? Why am I dealing with these knuckleheads? Why, why am I going through this problem? Why, why am I struggling? You're being tested. Why? Because God has a trusting place he wants to get you to. He has a place he wants to take you, but in order for you to occupy the place of trust, you got to pass the place of test. That's good. That was worth coming right there. If I, I don't know about you. I was just worth coming. You're either being tested or being trusted. And so Abraham understood this. And so Genesis 22, verse 1, And it came to pass that after these things that God tested Abraham. He didn't tempt him. He tested him. And said to him, Abraham, and he said, Here I am. Then he said, Take now your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. And then it goes on to say that he takes him up on the mountain. He takes two servants with him. He's got, uh, he's got Isaac loaded up. Um, with, with all the wood, Isaac even asked the question, where's the sacrifice? How, who are we going to kill? What are we going to kill? And, and Abraham says, God's going to provide. He's going to take care of it. They go up to the top of the mountain. He builds the place where they're about to light the fire. Abraham has got the knife in his hand. He's about to kill Isaac. Wait! The, Ab the, the angel yells. The angel of the Lord yells from heaven. I'm glad he's loud. <laughs> Wait! And he stops, and Abraham goes, whew. And he goes, hey, Abraham, this is the Maxwell translation. I know that you fear God now. Don't kill him. Don't, don't kill your son. Don't, don't take the life of your son. And Abraham makes this statement. And before I read the statement, I, I want you to hear this. This is really cool what happens. Everybody say sacritude. Come on, say it one more time. Say sacritude. In the Bible, we're just going to take a little parenthesis moment. In the Bible, God reveals himself in names all through the scriptures. Matter of fact, there's 10 specific names that he reveals himself as. Things like Jehovah Rapha, God is my healer. Jehovah Nisi, God is my banner. Jehovah Kadesh, God is my sacrifice. Jehovah Shalom, God is my peace. Jehovah Elohim, the Lord our God. Jehovah Sidkenu, God my righteousness. Jehovah Rohi, God is my shepherd. 
Jehovah Shammah, the Lord is present. Jehovah Sabbath, the Lord of hosts. Jehovah Jireh, the Lord my provider. Do you know the first name that God reveals himself as is Jehovah Jireh. And it's when Abraham is willing to sacrifice. It wasn't until he was willing to take the life of his son in order, to, he, the willing to sacrifice his son that he saw the ram that was caught in the thicket. And he declared that God is my provider. It's the moment that we are willing to sacrifice that the blinders from our eyes are taken away and God is revealed as our provider. It's never easy to sacrifice, but every time we decide to sacrifice, God shows up in provision. God shows up in provision. Listen, sacrifice is never forced. It's never forced upon you. It's given as a test so that God can take you to a new level of provision. Listen, I know you've got a big dream in your life. This is for somebody. You've got a big business in your life, and God's going to test you. He is testing you with that dream so that you can be ready to step in to that place because the only way that you can see God as your provision in that dream is to be tested before it. Okay? So now, here, here, here's, here's the last attitude. Okay, so we got the generosity, we got the sacritude, and then here's the last one is the reapitude. This is the boomerang attitude. <laughs> the reapitude. That's a good one too, man. Come on, don't be shouting me down because that's good names and stuff. Now, this attitude sometimes can be translated as kind of a get-rich-quick kind of scheme. Like if I give, I'm going to get. I'm going to get. I got to give so I can get. You know, I got to give this so I can get myself a Cadillac. Okay, that's not the point of the repetude. That's not the point of the boomerang effect. That's not the point of Galatians 6, 7 that says don't be misled. Remember that you can't ignore God and get away with it. A man will always reap just the kind of crop that he sows. Now, we may think that that was, that, 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 that was spoken in the New Testament. Actually, in the book of Genesis is where God started this principle of seed time and harvest. Genesis 8.28, it says, while the earth remains, seed time and harvest. Seed time and harvest. Seed time and harvest. The reapitude. What comes around goes around. What I reap is what I sow. See, in order to understand the boomerang effect, we've got to know some things about the reapitude, the attitude. So if, this is last, just a couple things I want to share with you before we go. Number one, write this down. What you sow is what you will reap. Now you say, oh, that's just so elementary. But the truth of the matter is a lot of people forget the whole truth of what I sow is what I will reap. I can't get mad at God if I'm reaping orange, oranges, okay? I'm reaping oranges, but I keep trying to sow, I, I keep, I, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm sowing apple seeds and I'm reaping oranges. I can't, I can't get mad at God because I think I'm going to get something that I'm not sowing for. What you sow is what you will reap. Don't get mad if, you're, if you plant corn and expect avocados. Yeah. You're just not going to get avocados if you plant corn. You can't expect good relationships if you don't sow the seed of friendships. Yes. Yes. We want good, I want a good relationship. But you're all isolated and stuff. I wouldn't talk to anybody. I wish I could get involved in this church. I wish I could meet some people in church. Are you serving? No. Are you going to life group? No. I'm late to church. I leave early. I sit in the back. I don't talk to anybody, but I want relationships, Lord. You're sowing avocados, expecting corn, man. What's up with that? See, you reap what you sow is what you reap. You, you can't expect more time if you're not serving God. You can't expect business success if you don't sow hard work. I got this great business idea, so I'm just going to sit in my house and let God work it out. Anybody that has any sense in business knows that ain't going to work. You got, a hard, you got some hard work. Yeah, the dream is real good. Sounds really good on Sunday. Pray over it. Just, I mean, anoint it with oil, 
Crisco, you name it, just put it all over that bad boy. But on Monday, you better get up and do some hard work. That's, that's the sowing and reaping aspect. You can't expect financially if you don't sow money. See, if God can get it through you, he will get it to you. If God can get it through you, he can get it to you. He will get it to you. You have a need. Here's, here's how God works. You have a need. All of us have some need in our life. So God will always give you a need so he can meet your need when you meet that need. So don't ask me to say that again. I don't think I could. <laughs> he always presents. That's, that's how he works. He supplies seed to the sower. Another way to say it, he's, he supplies need to the needer. We all need need. We need it. <laughs> because that opens up the door for us to reap what we sow. Here's the second thing about the reapitude. Let your neighbor say reapitude. Hit your other neighbor say reapitude. Where you sow is where you will reap. Where you sow is where you, where you will reap. Where you will reap. Isaiah 32, 20. I love this verse. Blessed are you who sow beside all waters. Blessed are you who sow beside all waters, who send out freely the feet of the ox and the donkey. Ecclesiastes 11, 1. Cast your bread upon the waters, plural. So many times we get focused on one river that we miss the benefit of the streams that are around it. So that means God's basically saying, don't just limit the sowing of your seed to one particular place. Expand, because where you sow is where you will reap. Number three, reap a two. Number three is it takes time. It takes time. Now, when, when I, I grew I told you we were po, and my mom, it was just me and my mom, only child, no, no brothers and sisters, and it was just me and my mom, only, she was a single mom. And she worked pretty much in the evening. She was very attractive, 5'10", blonde hair. So she worked at a bar slash um, um, restaurant. And she, she made most of her money in the evening. So she would go to work at 3 o'clock, and then she would get home at like 2 o'clock in the morning. And so I would come home by myself from age about 6 or 7. I would come home. I was a latchkey kid. You know, I had a key around my neck, and then I'd go unlock the door. I'd go in. I'd do my homework by myself most of the time. My mom let me play outside for a little bit. And then, and then she had purchased uh, Hungry Man dinners for me. We would go to the grocery store, and I'd get to pick out any Hungry Man dinner I want, wanted. I love the Salisbury steak. How many Hungry Man dinner people we got in the house? Right? Y'all remember Hungry Man dinner? About six or seven of you, okay. That's for the old people in the room. They don't, Swanson, you don't even see Swanson in people's refrigerators anymore. But I had Swanson Hungry Man dinners. You know, you had to, you had to put, the, put it in the, in the oven. The oven. You know that big thing that you have in your house? It's the one that you have to turn on. It takes about 15 minutes for it to heat up. Come on, you know what I'm talking about. I know you don't use it because you need to get one of my wife's cookbooks. So then you'll start using it more often. You reap what you sow. Come on, man, just buy that cookbook for your wife and you'll start reaping some serious goodness. Where you sow is where you sow. Oh, it works! I'm telling you right now. Is that good, honey? Did I do that right? Say everything you want me to say. So, so here's what I'd have to do. Okay, hungry man, Salisbury steak, or I could have Thanksgiving dinner, turkey. That turkey one was the best. But the, the Salisbury steak was my favorite because it had mashed potatoes, green beans, apple cobbler. Right in the middle, the apple cobbler. Turn the oven on. Come on, y'all follow along. Some of you young people, you know what I'm talking about. Turn it on, 375, preheat the oven. That took about 15 minutes. And then you had to put it in for 40 minutes. But the last 10 minutes, what'd you do? Peel back the apple cobbler so it could get crispy on the top. So look, I'm looking at, as seven, eight-year-old kid, I'm looking at least a minimum of about 50 to 55 minutes before I ate dinner. Until in the early 80s. I was about 12 or 13 years old. My mom comes home with this huge box. It's called a, a microwave oven. And I thought I got saved. I didn't even know what saved was. I didn't know who Jesus was back then. 
But I'm telling you what, she brought that bad boy in and plopped, and it was probably about this big. She plopped it right up on the counter, and she goes, you're going to love this. And she pulled a Swanson meal out. She stuck that bad boy in there. She ripped all of the, the aluminum foil off the top. I'm like, Mom, no, you don't do it that way. you gotta t- you got to wait a little bit. She goes, no, 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 you just put it in there. She put a piece of uh, paper towel over top of it, turned to three and a half minutes, and in three and a half minutes, I had steaming hot Salisbury steak. <laughs> and you know what that made me? It made me very impatient. Because from that point forward, I wanted everything in three and a half minutes. Listen, God is a God of seasons. And every season is necessary. Just because you're not reaping in this season, don't quit sowing. Don't quit sowing. Don't quit sowing. Don't quit. It takes time. It takes time. It takes time. It takes time. So keep getting seed into the ground because it takes time. Time, Galatians 6, 9, and let us not grow weary while doing good, for in due season you will reap if you do not lose heart. In due season, everybody say due season. This is the principle of seasons. The principle of seasons is extremely important when it comes to God. We, go, we love spring, we love summer, we kind of like fall, we hate winter. Okay? And because we hate winter because there's no harvest in winter. But see, in order for the harvest to come in spring and summer... The things that can't produce need to die off in the wintertime. Those are the things that need to go away during the wintertime. Those have to go, they have to be frozen away, dealt with, put aside in order for us to experience the harvest. It takes time. It takes time. Don't grow weary. Don't quit tithing just because you're not seeing a harvest right now. Don't quit giving. Don't quit being generous. Don't quit having a sacritude. Keep pushing, keep pushing, and keep pushing. And then you'll get into the season. Now, here's the last thing, and then I'm done. Sow to your harvest, not from your harvest. Sow to your harvest, not from your harvest. In other words, where do you want to go? What do you want to achieve? Sow to that place, not from where you are. John Maxwell has a law in the 21 Irrefutable Laws of the Leader called the Law of the Lid. And he talks about self-imposed lids that we have in our life. If I were to take a balloon right now, and I were to let that balloon go, how high is it going to go? To the ceiling. How high can it go? It can go as high as it wants to. All i got to do is get rid of the ceiling. How many ceilings have we put in our life because we're sowing from where we are instead of to where we want to be? If you're believing God to go into a new position, you start sowing generously toward that position. Now, for my wife and I, this changed when we began to give percentage instead of amounts. We changed from giving $100 a month or $200 a month or $500 a month or $1,000 a year. We changed from that to 2%, 5%, over and above our 10 10%. We're tithers. We've always been tithers for the, for the last 25 years that we've, been, we've known each other. We've always been tithers. But over and above, we decided a long time ago that we were going to be percentage givers, that we were going to give a percentage. When you start giving percentage, then God, you reap a percentage increase. You start seeing, di- instead of just amounts, because then God begins to bless you according to the percentage, not the amount. It changes everything about your life. We started going from 12% to 15% to 18% to 22%, even as a church. Even as a church, we decided where we wanted to go, and we sowed sowed toward the harvest. We knew that as a church, we wanted to have influence globally, not just here. So we began to sow globally. We sought out ministries in different parts of the world that we wanted to harvest in. And so we started to sow toward that. In areas, as a church, as a church, we did that. And God has tremendously blessed us as a church. So to your harvest, generosity, sacritude, and repetude. Sometimes you just need a little attitude adjustment, just a little adjustment. For some of us today, maybe just a little adjustment so that we can experience the fullness of God 
and what he wants to do in our life. I'm going to get my wife to come up here in the end here. Just, just for the last couple minutes, I want to just end, end with a challenge uh, in regards to kingdom builders. Uh, because for some of us, I, I, and I said this at the beginning, I, I, can't, I, I think that this kingdom builders is important for you personally. I feel, I feel the importance and the, the, the incredible promise that's wrapped around this because I, I feel like that many of you in this room, you have some dreams and aspirations that are God-given promises. And you've been kind of circling it. You've been circling it. It's like when the plane can't land, it just keeps circling the field. You've been circling the field. And it's time to stop circling the field. It's time to land. And so God is presenting you with an opportunity to be a kingdom builder. And he's saying, will you pray and commit and give? Will you take a step of faith over the next few weeks? I'm not asking you to do anything today. If you committed to Kingdom Builders for 14, 15, 2014, 15, then honor your commitment. We're ending it today. Matter of fact, as you leave today, uh, you're going to have an opportunity to give. And, and uh, there's envelopes in front of you. You can text to give. Thank you so much for the online people. But over the next few weeks, I want to challenge you. We want to challenge you. Um, one of the things that we've done, and I wanted her to come up here because I want you to hear this from our heart, is we have, we have done our best to not present finances in a manipulative way. Because I, I know everybody who's been a Christian for more than about six weeks have seen how many times those organizations sometimes can try to manipulate you. I don't, I don't ever want to be in that position. I like challenge. And I feel like God is challenging us as a church. And we've seen amazing things happen in our life personally. Yeah, I just wanted to share with you just just to be open and honest about where, where the two of us have come from, not from any sort of a way to brag and say, look what we've done, because that's not our heart and that's not who we are. But um, when we moved to Charlotte and God said, I want you to pick up, I want you to leave everything and I want you to go to Charlotte. Um, when we got here, we, we started the church and we had already sacrificed quite a bit. We sold everything. Um, we came down here. We didn't have any debt whatsoever because we didn't want to start the church with any debt. Um, we uh, had a car that was 15 years old. Um, 230,000 miles. 236,000 miles um, because it was paid for. And that was our heart and our attitude. And I remember um, Troy just like, man, we have to anoint this car every week. And we literally anointed that car with about a quart of oil every, every week. week. Every week. Um, and we even went to Atlanta one time to uh, see our pastors, and they wouldn't let us park in their driveway because it leaked so bad. Um, <laughs> Terrible. But, but here's the thing <laughs> is that um, God asked us to give away our car. That, that ended up happening to us three different times. And so Troy and I were like, okay, but he said, I don't want you to give away the 236,000 mile car. I want you to give away your other new car that's paid off. I want you to give that one away. And I just got a brand new stereo in that bad boy. Yeah. I'm talking like, it was thumping stereo. <laughs> yes. And it had like where you lift up the trunk. It was all the stuff like in the trunk that I don't even know what it was. And the dashboard like did all lit it was up. Sweet. And, yeah. And, and God's like, I want you to give that one. And, um, that happened three different times where God asked us to give away a car and three different times he asked us to give away our retirement. And um, We don't recommend you do that. We, we actually don't recommend <laughs> that you do that. But what we do is we recommend that you do whatever God asks you yeah. to do. Yeah. You see, what he was trying to cement in us is this is one of the things I really want you to hear today is the taller the skyscraper, the deeper the foundation he will dig. Yeah. The bigger that he wants to do things in your life, sometimes the more he will ask you to sacrifice like he did with Abraham. He said, I want to make you a great nation, but I got to see what you got. I got to see where your heart's at because before I can build something big on Come you, on. Yeah. I got to know your foundation is Good. stable Good. and that I can Good. trust you. And so God asked us, man, to take that test over and over and over again. And we just want to encourage you that still wherever, we, we're still taking that test. My husband kind of has this philosophy, um, and I can see when he gets that look on his eyes. He's like, if it doesn't hurt us to give it, it's not worth it. And so we kind of live in a place of being uncomfortable. And here's, here's the last thing I want to say to you, and I want you to hear me, and I believe this is for somebody today, is if you can't trust God with your finances, how can you trust him with the dream that is in your heart? that you wanna see come to pass. 
And if we can't trust God with our finances, how can we trust our God with our eternity? Yeah, that's good. So somewhere in our heart, there's some things that we've got to cement and understand, and we've got to take the trust test. Yep. Because see, the number 10 in the Bible, the tithe, the tenth, that was a, a trust. That was a test of trust. Whenever you see the number 10, the 10 plagues, you see the 10 virgins with the oil, the 10 commandments, all of those are trust tests. And if we can't trust God with something small, he's like, man, I want to do something big on you. I just got to get you to trust me. That's good. So that's what this whole thing is about. And thank you. Yeah, good. Very good. So you have one of these cards in your, um, in your note sheet. And I, I don't want you to do anything unless God spoke to, you, spoke to you today. I don't want you to do anything with it. I just, just want you pray. to take it home yeah. and pray. Pray, commit, and then give on December 5th and 6th for this uh, particular thing. Would you just pray over everybody as we get ready to go home? Absolutely. God, I just thank you for every person that is in this room. And God, as this is being streamed all over the world, God, that we understand there are people that are waiting on the other side of our obedience that they may never even step into Freedom House Church, but Lord, that your word is literally going across the globe right now. God, I ask you not for equal gifts, Lord, but for equal commitment from each and every person. Lord, that we sow to our harvest, God, that we are sowing, believing, and expecting for you to show up big in our life. God, just speak to us. Ask us to do what our part is. Lord, not somebody else's part. Yes. But God, just what you would have for us to do. And that looks like different things for each of us. God, would you just allow our hearts to just hear what you would say and do what you would say for us to do, no matter what that looks like. We just believe that, God, today. In Jesus' name, Amen. thank you. Amen. Amen. Amen.